Welcome back for more danger, intrigue, and espionage in Ian Fleming's The Diamond Smugglers. The first non-fiction work by Ian Fleming, and a distinct variation from his usual Bond novels. We'll come back to Diamonds Are Forever later. The Diamond Smugglers is an interesting look at the state of African diamond mines and the smuggling of diamonds out of Africa in the 1950s. Fleming interviewed a man named John Collard. I accidentally called him John Cottrell in the last video. Please excuse me. Um, talking about his experience working with an agency that was designed to sell diamonds legitimately and to keep illegitimate ones from being removed from the country. The last video, which you should probably watch before this one, please go back and do so if you haven't already, talks about the background. And today we're going to pick up with chapter 6 and see what else the Diamond Smugglers holds for us today. We'll have some James Bond connections. We'll talk about the issues of censorship or possible censorship of this book. And we'll wrap up with some very Bondian moments in a book that has been decidedly factual and direct. So we left off, we finished chapter 5 talking about Henry Orford. We're going to pick up now with chapter 6. So it begins with John Blaze. Uh, John Collard's alias in this book. We're going to use John Blaze just for simplicity's sake. John Blaze orders uh, rum and coke, but complains that the uh, drink has been watered down and is not actually a rum and coke, but rather some kind of cheap substitute. And there's a big kind of <laughs> bit of falderall about, you know, selling cheaper beverages at full price. And after that, he talks about going to an, some kind of exotic cabaret dance and falling asleep. It's a very interesting kind of pickup. It helps give us some idea of the kind of man that John Blaze was, but at the same time, feels a bit out of place in this smuggling book. And then Ian Fleming asks him, how about women? Are there stories about woman smugglers, female smugglers? And I was expecting something like the inspiration for Pussy Galore's Flying Circus. You know, this gang of hardened lesbian criminals who are extremely professional and very dangerous, you know, who would pull off this big diamond heist. But Blaze goes on to say that the, that really was never the case, that there weren't really that many woman smugglers, and there weren't even that many women working in his department to protect the diamonds. He notes that those that did, who worked in the offices and, you know, kind of in the sorting rooms, things like that, did a really good job. They were very brave and professional and resourceful and, and highly respected for their work and truly cared about what they were doing. But he notes that when it came to smugglers, they were almost exclusively men. He then goes on to talk about uh, the mining in Sierra Leone. In this case, sort of illicit mining, that people would just go out in the wilderness and start digging and digging and finding all kinds of different stones and things like that. And that because of all these like random unlicensed operations, it was difficult to sort of pinpoint what to do next or how to address this problem, that it was all just a state of big confusion. And then we're introduced to the man named Rosen, a German immigrant looking to kind of move to England and begin his life anew, who agrees to work for Blaze's firm, kind of exposing diamond smuggling and working on these cases in exchange for money. And his wife is the closest we get to a, a lady involved in smuggling. And even then, her part is so small, it's not even really worth mentioning. She just happened to be in the right place at the right time. But there's this big story about this man named Rosen buying up illegal diamonds and then giving them to the network to sell legally and so on, and trying to kind of flush out who these contacts are, and who's smuggling what where, and whatnot. It's a very long anecdote, but we're definitely made to respect Rosen for basically gambling with his life and trying to expose these smugglers. And there's talk of a, a million pound offer that the government, the English government, gives a million pounds to buy up illegal stones and put them into legal circulation. So it's a very interesting thing, and one of the more positive aspects of the book, you know, trying to hunt down these big smugglers, not with, you know, manpower and guns, but with just trying to buy them out to make it so their business isn't feasible. Chapter 7, Ian Fleming goes off on a tangent again, and this time it was drinks and cabarets. This time it's all about uh, who he was and who John Blaze was to other people. So he talks about going to these nightclubs in Tangier and the other places they stayed and lying to everyone, telling them that John Blaze is an expert on the coelacanth, the rare kind of prehistoric fish. 
and so on, and inventing this cover identity. So no one knows that he's actually working on this book on diamond smugglers and whatnot. He's keeping it all top secret, and they have fun inventing this little cover story and whatnot. It makes for an amusing bit. And then we get to what's probably the most boring part of the book, the part about Senator Witherspoon, who wants to finance a diamond mine in Liberia. But they're not exactly sure what he wants or what he's trying to do. They sense there's an ulterior motive there. And this whole chapter is presented as a diary between the main geologist and Senator Witherspoon, or I should say, the geologist's diary and the correspondence with Senator Witherspoon would be more accurate. And this goes on and on, and it's very hard to follow. Exactly, if, is the senator corrupt, or is he just looking for like a little side hustle? We don't really know, and it's done in such a roundabout way that I was pretty disinterested and disappointed in that section of the book. I will say, in the end, the senator sells his shares out, the mine is deemed as not appropriate or not effective enough or whatever and there's this, just all this confusion about it and you know it's mostly again just about Mr. Rosen going in and kind of buying up as, as they call in the book the leaks you know, finding the people who are selling diamonds on the side and addressing them one way or the other it's not a good chapter one of the low points of the book chapter 8 we're getting to the end chapter 8 is probably the one that addresses racism the most. Racism has popped up in other places in the book, too. We see it when he talks about, when Blaze talks about the security equipment, how he calls it the white man's magic, and so on, to fool the, the workers, the, you know, the uneducated people they hired just to dig up the diamonds, you know, to kind of trick them into believing that they were being, you know, surveyed or being x-rayed when they really weren't. It's an odd bit there. And uh, when he talks about the waiting rooms, how the white people have their own waiting room, and the black people a different one, you know, but those instances are fairly short, and I was willing to kind of overlook them, but this is the chapter where John Blaze goes all out and says, you know, that the uh, native African politicians were not trustworthy, they were all just cozying up to the white politicians who were in charge, and they're all sellouts, and so on. There's a lot of this in here, and it makes for a very uncomfortable read. On one hand, it's a product of the time, and I'm curious if the Diamond Smugglers is ever, you know, censored in its republication. I know it's been republished at least once. If it's ever censored, you know, would they change that part or admit or omit that part entirely? It's kind of hard to say, but it's not a comfortable read at all. And it's pretty obvious that Blaze was, you know, very pro-colonial. He believed that those territories should still be under British control or, you know, who's ever control different parts of Africa, depending on it. So it's awkward by today's standards, but it's also kind of hypocritical because Blaze earlier in the book talked about how his team needed to cozy up to the local politicians to get the job done. Now he's accusing these you know, native African politicians of doing the same thing and I don't know, I'm not a big fan of that part, but he talks a lot about how riots and you know, local thieves were just you know in endless supply and there was always some kind of issue going on that they had to address and that you know there would always be diamond thieves they knew they'd never catch all of them so kind of an interesting bit he ends the chapter by talking about how his agency pays for the stones legitimately and that they would take things into account like the quality of the stone and the number of carats and use that to determine its worth. They wouldn't just randomly pull out a diamond and sell it to somebody. And I like that too, trying to kind of establish credibility for his group, but I don't like the way he tears everyone else down. Chapter 9 is probably the most Bondian moment in the book, because it feels a lot like something out of one of Fleming's Bond books, especially Thunderball, which we'll get to in a moment. So it begins with another weird Flemingism. We've seen a few before, his description of the ostrich killing a chief of security by impaling his heart, his incredible his just lack of caring, really, about child trafficking. But now we come to Fleming is walking down the beach with Blaze. Blaze is tearing up the notes that he took to write this book and throwing them into the ocean and watching them just be churned to a pulp. And then he runs over and starts stamping on the Portuguese men of war the jellyfish-like creatures that have washed up on the shore, and he's sitting there stepping on these jellyfish, listening to them explode. It's such a weird bit. Fleming is good at that, writing something that's just so strange it sticks in your memory. But we get to, as I was saying, a Bondian moment, 
I guess maybe Thunderball wasn't the best comparison. Moonraker would probably be even better because Thunderball hadn't been published yet. But we get the description of the ultimate diamond kingpin, Monsieur Diamet, who no one has ever seen. He's believed to be German, but it's not confirmed. And Blaze warns Fleming, if you go looking for this man, he will kill you. He will not hesitate to do that. So, you know, Blaze explains to Fleming, don't go looking for him, don't go to this city, and don't ask for this man, because if you do, oh, you'll be dead. And he gets this big description. He's above the police because he bankrolls the police, and only secret services know about him, but they can't catch him, and he's very dangerous, and there's a huge build-up to this villain. Again, it reminds me so much of Blofeld's intro in Thunderball. But we never meet this villain, and he's never even you know, come close to being apprehended. There's a little bit of talk about capturing some of his couriers, or I'm assuming they're his couriers, uh, certainly very similar, but it, you know, all this build up to something that isn't even there. And then there's this weird anecdote kind of thrown into all that about how they have to keep track of legitimate diamond purchases, and in the past a legitimate merchant can be mistaken for a uh, fraudulent one for a smuggler based on how much they deliver and where they're shipping the diamonds to and so on. This one man was arrested, but he was actually a real merchant, so they couldn't prosecute. And it, it's kind of a weird conglomeration. If they just stuck to the Monsieur Diamet part, if they just stuck to that, you know, this is the diamond supervillain moment there, I think it would have worked a lot better. I'm kind of disappointed by that. This build up to a villain that we're never ever going to see. And it ends with another kind of weirdly Bondian moment of Blaze talking about how tired he is. He wants to quit all this diamond business and just have a quiet job. He's tired of chasing people all over Africa and whatnot and arresting people and getting involved in all these sting operations and smuggling things. He just wants a basic job. It's a really human moment, and I like it a lot. And we get the most kind of Bondian reference to the last line of Ian Fleming's Diamonds Are Forever, it reads better than it lives, is quoted by Blaze. How these are all great stories, this book will sell a million copies and so on, but at the end of the day, it's much better to buy a paperback and sit there and read about it than it is to actually do it. And that really ends the book in a kind of a somber way, much more somber than I expected. Not that, you know, even Bond novels aren't above having a sad ending, but I was kind of surprised that this one had such a sad denouement. And Blaze reflecting on, was their job worth it? At the end of the day, he seems to think it was, because they did catch some big criminals, they did have some, you know, good hauls and whatnot, but at the end of the day, did it really matter? There's still diamond smugglers out there. And it's an interesting place to end. And we get this little postscript. Fleming receives a newspaper clipping in the mail from Blaze. And it's a clipping about arresting this diamond smuggler or so on, this courier who, um, you know, was trying to cover up his tracks and got caught. And it's a big, long story. But the interesting part isn't the story. It's at the very end, all that's in this envelope, besides the clipping, is a little message from Blaze that says, Who wouldn't rather play golf? And that's all. And that's the, actually the note that we end on. So it's very strange to think that this book would end in such a bleak way. That this man who had done all this time, all this trouble, all this effort to prevent diamond smuggling, you know, in the end of the day is like, you know, hmm, I'm done with it. You know, who, who wouldn't rather go out and play golf than chase after these crooks all day? Interesting bit to end on. So, all in all, we've covered the whole book now. The Diamond Smugglers, an interesting read. It's dated, you know, the racist angles are definitely there, I totally get that. Some of the anecdotes are way too convoluted, and I'm not exactly sure what they're going for. But it's a cool time capsule into the history of the time, and it's really interesting to see Fleming, you know, interview and write about this person in a very kind of one-on-one -on -one way. There are, you know, various film uh, excerpts, pieces of film, film footage of Fleming talking to different people, or even some audio tapes of him like interviewing Raymond Chandler and stuff, but it was really cool to actually have him write a whole book about his interaction with another person. And it's also neat that Diamonds Are Forever gets a shout out, and indeed uh, I know at least some of the research for these two books overlaps between each other, because Diamonds Are Forever of course deals with diamond smuggling as well. But uh, an interesting 
read all told. Next time, when we come back to Bond, we'll review and discuss Fleming's Thrilling Cities, which I think will be a, a more varied um, review. I do like on the back, it notes how it is indeed a bonded tour, and indeed we'll get a Bond story in this book. So, pretty interesting stuff. But this will be for the next book review. I hope you enjoyed a bit of something different. We'll be back to the Beach Boys next week, though, no worries. Until next time, my friends, uh, double check all your diamonds and make sure you bought them legitimately and not through the smuggling pipeline. I'll see you next time. Have a good one. Thank you.